Hey, I'm Hypermobile, and if you're listening to this, you might be too. Hi, my name is Alex, and I'm your Hypermobile host, and today we're talking all about fashion and hypermobility and how the clothing you wear might be affecting how you're feeling. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that fashion is necessarily going to make a huge difference in your symptoms. However, I'm all about fighting for those marginal gains. So when I work with patients in my clinical capacity as an osteopath in the UK, I'm dealing with complex chronic treatment resistant presentations. And that means that you have to be thoughtful, you have to be strategic, and you have to be fighting for those 1% improvements. I look for things that are what I refer to as high yield. And these are things that patients are doing really all the time. And most of us are wearing clothing all the time. So clothing can be something that's very, very high yield for a patient. Uh, We'll be getting to all my tips today. We're going to be talking about shoes, socks, trousers, or pants if you're from North America. We'll be talking about shirts, sunglasses, and more. So stay tuned and let's get on the journey of thinking about what we wear and how we feel. So starting with footwear. What I notice when I see patients, and I I see patients day in and day out who are hypermobile. These are the patients I see for the most part. And there seem to be kind of two camps in terms of footwear. There are the patients who have ankle sprains, recurring ankle sprains often, which we need to stop treating as just a a normal thing. If I have to hear it's just an ankle sprain one more time, I will lose it (laughs) because it's not just an ankle sprain. It's an injury and it can lead to chronic ankle instability. But Anyways, before I get on that tangent, that's an episode for another day. The patients who have ankle sprains, they typically are going to go for shoes, which offer a little bit more support. And these patients do tend to gravitate towards often high top shoes. I see a lot of young people wearing, um, I think they're called Doc Martens or shoes that are lacing up kind of over that ankle joint. And some of my patients with recurring ankle sprains do find that that gives them a little bit more stability in their ankle and that that really can make a difference for them. So instead of going for a brace. These are people who have a bit of a less uh, serious presentation, but they're choosing to use their clothing to support their ankle a bit, which I think makes a lot of sense. Now, I want to stress that everyone's a bit different. And I do have patients with unstable ankles who find that the high top shoe strategy really does not work for them. They find that then they can't feel their ankle roll starting and catch themselves. And for that reason, those patients will avoid those high top shoes. But I do see a lot of lace up high top shoes. The other type of shoe choice I see a lot of are very, very lightweight, bouncy, springy running shoes. And this is this is the camp I'm in. So I'm someone who has, I've never rolled my ankles. I've tried and my ligaments must just be very stretchy down there. I, I seem to be unable, knock on wood, to roll my ankles. And patients who are similar to me in that respect tend to go for a running shoe, but I I mean a running shoe that's actually like meant for distance running, something that has quite a a springy bottom to it. And when you, I tell patients, I'm like, when you go to the shoe store, I want you to put your weight on your heels and kind of bounce up and down. And what you should see is that uh, the bottom of the shoe, that sole, I guess you call it, but the springy part underneath, it should be squishing as you're putting your weight through that part of the shoe. When you walk around the shoe store, you should feel bouncy. And because these shoes are made for distance running, I I used to wear um, like the Nike Pegasus ones for a while. Um, There are different brands that really do the same thing. So just find what works for you. But um, that bounce helps with efficiency of gait as well. So again, for patients who are feeling tired, they're having trouble walking distances, sometimes looking for footwear that gives them a little pep in their step and a little bit of that bounce can make a really big difference. So those are the two kind of main footwear things I see. In general, I think hypermobile patients are going to benefit from a lighter weight shoe. So regardless of whether it's, you know, a a running shoe or more of a high top shoe or whatever, I think that a lightweight shoe really does make a difference over time in terms of fatigue. If, you know, a, a lightweight doesn't feel heavy until you have to carry it all day long and shoes are weights that we carry on our feet. Um, The other thing I see in terms of footwear is a lot of my patients have house shoes and um, house Crocs in particular tend to be common in my patient population. Again, I want to say like I have no financial relationship with any of these brands. I have nothing to disclose here. These are all things I've bought for myself. Um, But Crocs (laughs) tend to help for a couple of reasons. Some patients love the bumpy texture on the bottom of the shoe or the, the part that your foot touches. Some patients hate it. But something that everyone seems to like in terms of a, a strategy here is the fact that it's very hard to stub your toes when they have a when they're enclosed, when they're 
uh, covered, <laughs> snuggled by a shoe topping layer, whatever you call it. When, they have, when the shoe covers the toes and you're trying to walk into the coffee table for the millionth time and you don't stub your toes, it's a beautiful thing. So if you haven't tried Crocs in the house, that might help you. They also do play quite nicely with insoles as well. So if you're someone who has to wear an orthotic and you don't want that orthotic sliding around, if you have Crocs, because of that textured surface on the bottom of the shoe, the insole tends to stay in place very, very nicely. So <laughs> there we go. Crocs, Doc Martens, and running shoes. Take your pick. Um, what I do want to say for shoes as well, though, is that some patients will make the choice to wear high heels to an event out. I like high heels, but I try and always be thoughtful about how I'm doing it. So I'm thinking about what's transportation going to look like that night? How unstable are these heels? And most importantly, I'm making sure that the next day is scheduled in my diary as a recovery day because I know that there's a risk that I'm going to have a bit of a overuse uh, injury. I often get a little bit of just like a I, you know, everyone's heels in theory hurt, or sorry, everyone's feet in theory hurt after they wear heels. I think that most people are going to say that they find them uncomfortable. So I think it makes complete sense just to schedule a rest and recovery day after a night out, regardless of who you are. <laughs> That's a tip for everyone. Now, if we move on up, something that I think helps a lot of people is wearing compression socks, but they don't necessarily have to be medical grade. So again, some of you may have been told by your cardiologist or your medical doctor that you need to wear compression grade socks. And if you've been given that medical advice, please, as always, listen to your medical doctor because they know you and your unique medical history, right? This podcast is for informational purposes only. However, if you're someone who doesn't know where to start with compression socks, you've seen them online, you're kind of interested in them, but not really sure, here's my recommendation. Check out a sporty brand of compression socks. So I'm a person who's very sensitive to um, <laughs> feelings. That's weird. I have sensory issues. I don't like how some things feel on my body. And I think um, some people have more issues with that and some people have less issues with that. And I'm someone who's pretty particular in terms of how fabrics feel. And I had been looking for compression socks for a very long time, but I don't like any sort of fabric digging in. Um, so I'm someone who has fairly muscular calves. Um, I don't have like the narrowest <laughs> calves and I have had issues before with fabric cutting in and it's not comfortable. And if it, the fabric's digging in, it's not helping you really. Um, so what I have found very helpful is looking for a sporty brand of compression socks. The ones that I'm wearing right now, you may have seen me with some very brightly colored socks in clinic. They are called Monkey Socks and it's actually a UK brand. And what I really like about how these ones have been designed is that the top is very thick. The band is very thick. And if people want, I will be making some accompanying videos like going through and kind of holding up the different garments and talking about what I think they got right, what I think they could do better. But compression socks with a thick band at the top can really, really help. And compression socks are something that in my head, honestly, I'd always been like, you know, it's for patients, it's not for me. I think a lot of healthcare providers have this thing where they pretend like they're super okay and maybe they're not always okay. And wearing compression socks sometimes, or even just bringing them with me in case I need them, has been a game changer. So if you're someone who's not sure, I really recommend that you give them a try. Uh, when I started wearing them in the evenings in clinic, I have some days where I'm in, at clinic quite late. I noticed that I felt so much more alert. It was way better than having a cup of coffee because blood was not pooling in my feet and legs. So if you're someone who's struggling with maybe end of day fatigue or that feeling of blood pooling, definitely give compression socks a try. They can make a big difference. Speaking of compression, something that I see a lot of hypermobile people doing. And these, these are often people who might not know that they have hypermobile connective tissue. It was certainly the way for me when, before I knew that I am um, someone who has some hypermobile connective tissue. But hypermobile people love compression uh, and it has to do with blood pooling. And I think some the sense of just having everything kind of held. I think that that feeling of having your, I, I talk about like having joints hugged. I think it feels really, really nice for hypermobile people. But um, leggings are a way that you can have a very, very mild compression garment just by simply buying regular off-the-shelf leggings. If you like leggings, lean into them. If you feel uncomfortable wearing jeans, just accept that you're a leggings person and that's okay. You, I, there was a point in my life I had dress leggings and workout leggings and day-to-day -day leggings. 
and work leggings actually so you can have if you need to have four different kinds of leggings for your activities you do that okay you enjoy that and embrace it but leggings can make a big difference Thinking about the fabric also can help in the construction. So again, in terms of um, blood pooling, and again, just to explain this briefly, blood vessels have a connective tissue component. The walls of blood vessels have a connective tissue component. And in hypermobile people, in some individuals, that connective tissue is going to be potentially a little bit hypermobile, which means that it's harder to maintain appropriate blood pressure and it can vary. And you may have heard of different conditions involving that. But it also makes it harder for us to get blood from your toes all the way back up to your head. It it's Firstly, it's a miracle. It happens even in normal people. I think normal anatomy and physiology is just incredible. But in a hypermobile body, everything becomes a bit harder or a bit different. And this is something where having a bit of that compression can just, again, prevent that blood pooling in the lower extremities. So if you're someone who benefits from that, go for it. With construction as well, two other things you can look for are a high waist on the leggings. Some people find that that feeling of fabric kind of pressing on the lower pelvis is really helpful, really stabilizing. And you might want to look for pockets in the sides of the leggings. Um, my argument for these is that it means that you might not have to carry on a purse because purses and handbags can be hugely problematic for shoulders and neck pain in hypermobile people. And if you're someone who has some degree of neurodivergence, maybe you're someone with ADHD or you're losing things, those pockets can be a lifesaver. So again, these are just little ways that you can look at your clothing and see how am I supporting my health the best that I can. In terms of fabric, I want to stress that there are different types of fabric densities and weaves. I was talking with a clothing company a few weeks ago and we were literally talking about different weights and hefts and all this terminology, which I'm probably going to not get quite right. But fabric varies. So be picky in how things feel on your body. Um, and if you do find a higher compression legging feels better for you, wear it. Uh, before I knew that I was hypermobile, I was going into stores with leggings and asking for the tightest leggings. And the shop clerk was saying like, oh, but don't you want these ones? They feel like you have nothing on. And I was like, no, I want to feel something. Help me feel something. I want your most compressive leggings. So that, and in hindsight, that was because I'm hypermobile. So think of different fabrics, think of different weights and try on all the leggings if it's possible for you and you have enough energy in a given day or maybe order them all to your house and try them on there. Now, moving on up, um, we have the upper, we have the upper body, right? So we have like shirts and jackets. How do we approach that? I think again, thinking in terms of weight. So if you can find um, lightweight garments, that's going to potentially help if you have, if you're someone with shoulder pain or neck pain, um, speaking briefly about outerwear for a second, I didn't realize how heavy my winter coat was until I got a new one that is warmer and lighter. And somehow this coat that I had lasted 10 years. Um, it was a parka <laughs> that I got ages and ages ago. But, uh, if you can find something that's lightweight, it might help you just get a bit less tired because you're lugging less stuff around. Um, going back to shirts themselves, layering is huge for hypermobile people. So a lot of hypermobile people struggle with something called dysautonomia. And that means that their autonomic nervous system, which controls all the stuff that you don't think about. So my heart beating right now, my lungs working and breathing, my tummy digesting food, like that's all stuff I'm not thinking of consciously right now. Your autonomic nervous system controls that. And your autonomic nervous system also controls temperature uh, in your body. So your internal thermostat, which we call thermal regulation. Hypermobile people are notorious for having problems with thermal regulation. And for that reason, it really does help if you are able to wear, change layers appropriately. Because honestly, there will be days where the room will be hot and you might feel cold. There will be days where the room might feel cold and you might feel hot. And even if you tend to lean one way, sometimes nerves are weird and you end up going the other. I find I'm the type of person who tends to struggle with being cold. A lot of my hypermobile patients are, but we see a wide variety of presentations depending on patient age, uh, depending on their hormonal makeup. So cater to yourself as an individual and don't be shy to take off those layers if needed because it's your health and it's important. Now, thinking of undergarments, bras are so problematic and here's why. I can't even begin to tell you the amount of times that the first bit of advice I give a patient is to change their bra. 
I see problematic bras day in and day out in my clinical work. And it's such an easy thing to make a difference and to change for patients for the most part. Not easy in the sense of finding bras that tick all the boxes and are supportive and comfortable and all these things, but it's something that compared to a lot of the other issue type robot people deal with should be relatively easy. Now, why are bras such a problem? Well, I see a lot of people wearing what I call like a, a Y-back bra or a racer back bra. And the problem with these straps, and, and these are the ones that kind of, they, they come in close to the neck, right? So it's a line up the back and they sit in really, really close or those like kind of strappy sports bras. They're often racer back bras. And the problem with having the straps close to your neck is that they compress on tissue directly on top of the brachial plexus. And the brachial plexus is the term that describes the network of nerves that go on to supply the, the nerves. And so they go on to provide to eventually branch off into the nerves in your arm. So we have the spinal cord itself. We then have nerve roots. So the little bits that exit between the bones of your spine. We then have um, the brachial plexus. So these are kind of these thicker bundles of nerve fibers that then eventually start to branch when they cross through kind of the armpit region. They start to branch off and you get the median nerve, the radial nerve, the ulnar nerve, and often patients will have heard of these nerves. So the problem with these racer back or Y back bras is that we get extended compression over time and once patients know that this contributes to their neck cha- neck pain, it's a game changer. Because in my clinical work, I'm always thinking of not only the positive intervention rate, the, the treatment that I, I'm doing or that I'm trying to help that patient access, but the uh, re-injury rate. We have to be thinking of the re-injury rate. If that patient is continually re-injuring themselves, themselves regardless of how good I am at my work, regardless of that, it's going to be impossible to get a good clinical outcome because the re-injury rate is so high. So we need to find really strategic and intelligent ways to bring down that re-injury rate. And changing a patient's bra can, it can and often is the first step in doing that if there's someone who's wearing a bra. Now, with bras, what we really want are straps that sit out as wide as possible. So really on the bones of the shoulder And what I very frequently end up advising patients to do is to, if they're on their commute or they're wearing a baggy t-shirt or they just don't care, take one strap and tuck it under their armpit and then alternate throughout the day just because it gives that one side of their neck a little bit of a break to not have that constant pulling down tension there. Um, When it comes to rib pain and bras, that's a more complex problem. So you can certainly look at things like corsets. Uh, Some patients do find those helpful. There are different types of rigidities and different constructions. And the unfortunate thing is that because it's 2023, it's really hard to get corsets like off the rack. So you patients will often end up having to talk with someone who does make a bespoke option. The nice thing is it's bespoke. The bad thing is it's expensive. But corsets can make a big difference for those patients. For patients who don't have very much bra, uh, sorry, (laughs) for patients who don't have very much breast tissue, going braless is sometimes a great option as well. So regardless of what um, your situation is, it's essential that you're supported in finding an option that works for you as an individual. And finding the right type of bra situation is a place that I start with many of my patients. Now, Moving on up, (laughs) sunglasses. I love sunglasses. I live in London, UK. It is notoriously gray and rainy. And if you see me walking down the street, you will see me pretty much always with big black cat eye sunglasses on because I don't do well in bright light situations. I don't do well in probably moderate light situations. Now I live in rainy, dreary London, UK. But if you see me walking down the street, you're very often going to see me, regardless of the time of year, with sunglasses on. And this is because I know that I'm sensitive to light. Um, We have to remember that we have a lot of connective tissue structures in the eye. There are little muscles that control how much light is being let in. And hypermobile people often do have issues with um, light and sensitivity to light. So if you're someone who finds sunglasses helpful, embrace it. Also, there are many different kinds of sunglasses. Uh, Please do speak with your medical provider about this. I'll go into detail in another episode. But there's a whole world of sunglass tints for you to explore and lenses and um, even like the weight. So some hypermobile people will complain of the weight of the... um, (laughs) 
here we go with me not knowing my fashion terminology, but you know the part that goes over your ears, like the the legs of the sunglasses, I don't know what to call it, but that part, a lot of patients will find that it's like pressing down on their ears too hard. So speak with um, your optician or whoever you're buying the sunglasses from or whatever, or just try different pairs to find ones that are light enough to not irritate you. Uh, sunglasses can really make a big difference for hypermobile patients. And finally, I really want you to think about how you're washing your clothes. So Unfortunately, a lot of hypermobile individuals do have different types of skin sensitivities. These will often be people who might report getting hives from the sun or getting a rash after they work out from their sweat or having dermatographia, which is a condition where you take a, you know, you, you kind of scratch yourself and you get a big welt coming up. And although there can be other things going on, some patients will go on to be diagnosed with different types of mast cell related diseases and so on. What I want to say just as like a general bit of advice, and it's very rare that I say anything which I will say is direct advice on here, uh, because of course I can't give out medical advice because I don't know you or your unique medical history. But my advice to you <laughs> is to think about what you're washing your clothes in. If you can switch from a scented laundry detergent to an unscented one, do it. It can make a big difference if you're someone who's experiencing skin sensitivities and it's certainly worth trying if you're waiting for that appointment with that allergist or whatever. Just try cutting out anything scented in your laundry uh, washing process. Um, if you're someone who's into kind of more environmentally friendly things, there are these things called soap nuts. I've never tried them, but they might actually work really well. So go research soap nuts, look into unscented laundry detergent, and you really don't need fabric softener. So don't do it. The simpler, the better. Something unscented, wash your clothes, use that, done. You save time, you save money, and you're probably irritating your skin a bit less. Anyway, are there any ways I missed that you are using fashion to affect your hypermobile body? Are you someone who has an amazing cane? I was just actually at the Ellers Denlos conference in Dublin and I saw all kinds of canes which were gorgeous and which were clearly being used not only as mobility aids, but also to affect that individual's fashion and how they express themselves. Or maybe you're someone who's doing what I refer to as like a, a minimal bracing technique. Maybe you have a fabric brace that works really well for you. I was lucky enough to get to try out the body braid at the Ellers Danlos Society conference in Dublin as well. And we're seeing more and more of these really subtle ways of supporting people's joints and supporting their hypermobile connective tissue, but also making a little bit of a fashion statement at the same time. So, so if there's something I missed, let me know below and I'll catch you next time.